This is a WPTV special, the making of Filthy Rich, the Epstein story. Good evening and welcome to the making of Filthy Rich, the Epstein story. I'm Shannon Cake. For so many of us, we followed every twist and turn, the riveting and oftentimes galvanizing Jeffrey Epstein story. His massive human trafficking ring went on for years, starting right here in our community. It spanned cities and counties, continents. So it seems fitting that two men who call Palm Beach County home chatted, collaborated, mystified by this man who it seems continued on getting away with such an insidious crime. Each of these men, pros in their fields, would be the very men to write the tell-all book that prompted Jeffrey Epstein's fall from grace. But before we take you back, let's bring you up to speed on where things stand right now. Jeffrey Epstein is dead. His ashes here in Palm Beach Gardens, about 20 miles from his Palm Beach mansion. A college dropout, Epstein spent two years teaching, then turned to finance. He managed money for the super rich, like Les Wexner, owner of Victoria's Secret. In those circles, he became friends with the rich, famous, political elite, even royalty. I was recruited at a very young age. It's a past riddled with claims from then young teenage girls like Virginia Gouffre, who said they were recruited for Epstein, a sort of pyramid scheme of sex crimes. But in 2008, local and state prosecutors cut a deal with Epstein. Unfortunately, both the state criminal justice system and the federal criminal justice system failed the victims miserably. Ten years later, Epstein was arrested again. On July 18th of this year, he was denied bail and a month later put on suicide watch. On August 9th, more than 2,000 documents were unsealed, scathing depositions and affidavits with alleged victims and witnesses. One day later, August 10th, Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his Manhattan jail cell. Today, questions do persist about just what was going on inside Jeffrey Epstein's Palm Beach mansion. It was equal parts shocking and shrewd. How was Jeffrey Epstein getting away with it? And for a time, it seemed, getting the girls to just go away. Tonight, we focus on the two local men who had the guts and the grit to write the book that put the world on notice the abuse not only happened, but after Epstein was out of jail, it was continuing. We begin tonight of all places right here in our very own News Channel 5 studios. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this. Uh, I remember this place. This is where it all started. It really is one of the nicest newsrooms I've ever seen. It really is, isn't it? The backstory, the behind the scenes that led to Filthy Rich. It's good to have you back. Tommy. Tim so. Malloy. A former News Channel 5 anchor and investigative reporter. I was over there. You were over yeah. there. Yeah, yeah we, we did, did a bunch of stuff. Water. Yeah, the, the water. Cancer cluster a cancer, little bit. Yep. Years later, Malloy. This all sort of started in the Palm Beach Grill, just uh, chatting. And, and world-renowned author James Patterson would team up. No, we can't do that chapter. That chapter, that's He's not going to work. throw a eraser at me. never work. The driving force behind Filthy Rich, a tell-all on Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Filthy Rich is about a billionaire arrested for molesting underage girls. He served just 13 months in prison. Me, I throw the book out. It really started right here in this newsroom. Yeah, I was actually sitting at my desk and I'd gotten a call from a kid who said he was at Royal Palm Beach High School. And it was an older guy that the young girls were going to go give massages to. Mm -hmm. The caller, Molloy remembers, said the teenage girls were traveling, often across the bridge to Palm Beach, to a mansion and being paid big money for their visits. But the caller suggested there was more going on inside that mansion than massages. He was pretty emphatic and he said he'd call back and he didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't take his name because he was a kid. And I started asking around in Palm Beach where I lived to a police officer friend and he vaguely implied there was something up. But eventually I, I, I learned that there was a high profile person they were looking at over there for something. And the implication was of sexual. Malloy started talking to everyone he knew on Palm Beach. And then I found out kind of where it was. So I would drive by the house. Malloy couldn't confirm it, but quietly there was a very active Palm Beach police probe of Epstein, one of the most secretive and well-connected men on the planet. But it was somebody at the post mm -hmm. first got wind of 
an investigation. I believe named him first. I immediately kick myself and say, why wasn't it me? Because that's what we do when we don't get the story ahead of somebody else. But then, then it kicked into, wow. I'd actually seen him around town at a restaurant or two. I used to see him riding bicycles with, with young girls over near the Colony Hotel. And I, did that I, fuel it for you? Did that Well, fuel yeah, it? because you just knew uh, and, uh, that this wasn't one or two victims. One or two victims would have been enough, but you knew it was something bigger than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and of course it ended up being on an industrial scale. There was this tick-tock to it, and we got to stop them now. And of course, I was aware of that. Yeah, it's like trying to grab somebody before they go off a ledge. Don't let this happen to this kid, you know. Epstein, with homes not just on Palm Beach, but in New York. New Mexico and the Virgin Islands was now facing a string of serious charges in Palm Beach County. He was in town often fending off the allegations, everything from illicit acts on a child to molestation. Malloy wasn't the only one tracking the jet-setting billionaire. John Connolly was an investigative reporter for Vanity Fair and a great one. He had called me because he, had, I guess, vaguely heard that I was doing this, and then we became good buddies. And he knew a lot about Jeffrey because he'd been sort of watching him forever. So he was, John was into the forensics of this thing and the finance. He was a, a lawyer and a former New York City detective who became a writer. I ended up interviewing him a few times during this case, put him on our air here, your air, Channel 5. In fact, Malloy remembers well. It was right here in our studio anchoring a newscast when he had his first brush with what many called the intimidating and dark side of Jeffrey Epstein. Do you remember what the producer said to you in your ear? I do. <laughs> when we come back. I'm, I'm sitting there and we wear, we wear earpieces. We're not live we're in a commercial break. And in my ear, the producer says, Jeffrey Epstein wants to talk to you. I went, well, he's in his airplane. What, what are you talking about? I said, what, what does he want? And the producer said, he wants you to get your helicopter away from his airplane. It sent a little chill. And later, we started talking about the story. I said, my God, this is an insane story. I mean, all of 30, 40, 50, who knows how many girls. And then this guy gets off with 13 months down to 11. And I said, this is this is unbelievable. I mean, it's almost you couldn't believe it. You're watching a WPTV special, the making of Filthy Rich, the Epstein story. Welcome back to the making of Filthy Rich, the Epstein story. I'm Shannon Cake. Long before Jeffrey Epstein became the story, my former co-anchor and partner on the News Channel 5 investigative team, Tim Malloy, was tracking his every move, closely covering Jeffrey Epstein and so many of the Palm Beachers' indiscretions. It was September of 2007 in Palm Beach County, and Jeffrey Epstein had just returned with his high-powered lawyers. He was here to cut a deal with prosecutors and trying to avoid prison time. Police were accusing Epstein of unlawful sexual activity with teenage girls, even in one case, molestation. The local media was swarming, but none more pesky, perhaps, than News Channel 5 investigator Tim Malloy. You were uh, tracking Epstein really like nobody else in the country was tracking him. Probably, but I mean, I don't want to take too much credit. I lived there. I'd actually seen him around town at a restaurant or two. I used to see him riding bicycles with, with young girls. The younger, the better. I mean, anybody over 20, he wasn't interested in. And he was deeply interested in people on the very young side. I mean, there was a 12-year-old, there were a couple 14-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And that fueled you? Yeah, I don't even have kids, but I, you know, I wanted to get a baseball bat and go kill them. <laughs> I don't think I want to use it because I, I wouldn't have done that. But it... instead, Malloy tracked him. Epstein's personal 727 aircraft arrived at PBIA from Newark. With News Channel 5's helicopter hovering above Palm Beach International Airport, he desperately wanted video of Epstein getting off his private jet. Why did you want that image of him? No one ever saw this son of a bitch ever. But there was, there was no video of Jeffrey Epstein. There were some stills from parties in New York way back when, but he hadn't been seen in a long time. And there, here comes the plane. He's about to land, and we got him landing. We got him taxiing up, and he doesn't get out. So we're hovering with a live shot with his big lens, and uh, he never got out. So we go to uh, a commercial break. Do you remember what the producer said to you in your ear that night? He said to me, Jeffrey Epstein wants to speak with you in my earpiece, and then we're in a commercial break. And I went, 
what? I said, what, what does he want? And the producer said, he wants you to get your f***ing helicopter away from his airplane. But what struck me was just, you've been charged with a crime, we're a news organization, we followed you, this, we're obeying all the rules, aviation rules. Uh, screw you, we're not, we're not moving. And we didn't. This is a story. This is, what a story. It showed you how private, how arrogant, and how menacing the guy could be. It sent a little chill. And he knew you were onto him. Yeah, we were the ones that were going to get a picture of him. And we did. Malloy got his video, but says he was stunned by what Epstein didn't get. No prison time. Instead, a short stint in the local jail with daily, lengthy work release visits allowed to his office and his home. After that, his victims claim Epstein was back in business. Is that what fed you? Well, it fed me as he kept getting away with it, it seemed like, you know? I mean, in the sense that, uh, and he was arrogant about it, you know? I was like, you gotta stop this guy. That was sort of what I kept saying. You gotta stop him. You had to get him, you have to catch him. This never left you? No, it, it didn't. And I, I, got, I, I left Channel 5, great place, and I went on to make documentaries and stuff. I stayed in touch with uh, uh, John Connolly all the time on this. And, and then one day I had a conversation with James Patterson. I'm James Patterson. I write murder stories. Malloy had been producing documentaries alongside the number one bookseller in the world for 13 years running. The best I can do is tell their story. Fellow Palm Beacher, James Patterson. The two met up at the Palm Beach Grill and started chatting about possible future projects. And Tim brought up this Epstein case, which I was vaguely aware of. We started talking about the story. I said, my God, this is an insane story. I mean, all of 30, 40, 50, who knows how many girls, police reports on, on most of them. And then this guy gets off with 13 months down to 11. And I said, this is, this is unbelievable. I mean, it's almost you couldn't believe it. And it's tough to shock a guy like James Patterson, known for conjuring up menacing characters. In terms of the mysteries that I write, the Alice Cross, the Women's Murder Club stories, I mean, this character would, would be right up there with the worst characters I've ever created, and probably a little worse. I think if, if I was writing about a character like this, I probably would tone it down because you'd go, no, that's not possible. Nobody would believe this. I think it really is, I mean, with, you know, with, with fiction, it has to be uh, that you can tone down your disbelief. I think if I wrote this character, I think people would go like, oh, you've gone over the top. Nobody like this, whatever. You couldn't, there isn't anybody like this character. Is that what hooked you when you, it was just so It was a combination, it was a combination of, of um, the age of these girls, the number of them involved, the fact that it was happening here in Palm Beach, uh, and, 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 and then the plea deal, which was amazing, it was shocking. Was there ever a moment that you thought to yourself, this isn't what I do, I really, I don't, I don't do investigative, I need to stay in my lane. What, what was hard for me is I'm used to making stuff up. Right. That's my strength. Uh, can't do that with nonfiction or you shouldn't do that. And the second thing was what you can say and what you can't say. So that was, that was a learning experience for me. He connected with it immediately because he's really smart. Right. And he's a real crime writer, true crime writer, but this was, he, he connected with him. He, he mm. suddenly was extremely interested immediately. And uh, there was no hesitation. This thing was off and running. In days? I think within hours. The pair recruited Tim's Vanity Fair pal, John Connolly, and got to work writing. Filthy Rich was expected to hit shelves in the summer of 2016. The disturbing details with the power of the James Patterson name would ultimately drive it to the New York Times bestseller list. But not if Jeffrey Epstein's lawyers had their way. They would approach us pretty much every week. And I'm not afraid. I wasn't afraid of Epstein. You know, I don't care. So sue me. Uh, but this had to have been different. I mean, all respect, no you're not going to get really sued for care. defamation by writing about Alex Cross. But you are going to get sued by writing about I, Jeffrey I, Epstein. I could care less. I didn't care. I just, I don't run. I, I'm never going to run afraid of, of, of doing the right thing, of, of trying to tell the truth. This story, I never had any issues with this story because it was true. There was no doubt about it. And Jim, I got a hand of Jim Patterson. Jim Patterson, he's tough. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was scared. I, I think I was, <laughs> I was more afraid than he was. We're writing a book that they did not want us to write, and it wasn't me. It was James Patterson was writing this book, which means a lot of people are going to look at it. And they did. It was the New York Times bestseller. 
And they didn't want that to happen. They didn't want this book written, no. Jeffrey did not want this written. And you felt that? You could feel it. When we come back. Do you remember calling me and asking me to go to lunch? <laughs> this is embarrassing. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass No, I don't, you. No, I, don't, I, know, I, do, I do remember it. We had lunch. Right. And I think I said something along the lines of, and this is a little dramatic, but was if, if anything happens to me, you got to do the story. You're watching a WPTV special, The Making of Filthy Rich, The Epstein Story. Welcome back to The Making of Filthy Rich, The Epstein Story. I'm Shannon Cake. Some have described Jeffrey Epstein as the perfect storm of wealth and greed and connections and malice. World-renowned author James Patterson and former local reporter turned documentarian Tim Malloy, they were typing away and talking to everyone they could about one of the world's most secretive men. When you started writing this book, you said it was the first time in your life you had ever had anxiety. Yeah, I had, a, I had anxiety uh, because he was a menacing presence and he was looming, um, his, legal, his lawyers were, and, and he was uh, unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was capable of intimidation and maybe even violence. In fact, in the spring of 2016, former WPTV investigator turned documentarian Tim Malloy called and asked to have lunch at popular Cucina, Palm Beach. He spoke of his work with James Patterson, plans to pen an expose about Jeffrey Epstein. Do you remember what you asked me that day? I did, and I, it's a little embarrassing now, but, but I said if, you know, if something happens to me, you really have to keep going with the story because there's really something there and he's bad and he hasn't stopped. I didn't want him to get away with it. Molloy wasn't just working on the book, Filthy Rich. He was also writing and producing a documentary. Walk through this base in Bagram, Afghanistan, you'll meet people who've been deployed four or five times. And was about to embed with army troops on the forward operating base near Kandahar, Afghanistan. I think I also had an embed coming up, but it was more about, it was more about Epstein. Mm -hmm. There was a period there where I felt somewhat threatened because I lived in the same town and I heard that he was digging into people's past lives, not in mine necessarily, but I, he, this guy was playing hardball. When Epstein's lawyers called you, what, did, what were they saying every week? They were saying uh, basically um, you don't know what you're, you're getting involved with here, you should back off, there's going to be some retribution. And, you know, what Tim and I finally did, we sent a letter and we said, look, I, we would love to talk to Epstein. We would love to hear his side of things. Love to hear. Of course, they never, we knew they wouldn't. We suspected they wouldn't. We hoped that they would. Uh, and they didn't get back to us. And th the last thing in the book is I, I say that Epstein's lawyers had come to us and that we had said, you know, please, we'd love to have Epstein uh, talk to us. And then I end with, here are the, some of the questions I would have asked. And the last question was, how do you sleep at night? And apparently he didn't have any problem. What drew me into this is... Patterson had some problems, though, with the way his book was covered in the press. The story, he says, was largely ignored. I mean, one of the amazing things is when the book came out, really the only people that covered it at all when we brought the book out, you know, in any meaningful way, was the Wall Street Journal. Mm. And everybody else, I'm going like, what are you kidding? This, this, this story, how can you not? I, it really gets me um, curious. And how could they miss it? You know, I mean, now everybody seems to see it. Oh, my God, you know, it's, it's the worst of the Me Too cases. It probably is the worst of the Me Too cases. Um, I mean, it, it's worse than the Weinstein thing. It's worse than the Cosby thing. It's, you know, I mean, those are bad stories. This is, this is worse. Do you have any more money if I have sex with him? especially when I saw the police interviews with these girls. Yes. I mean, that's when you really went like, okay, right. this, is, this is really crazy, sick, insane. They were taped police interviews with the young victims that Patterson and Malloy detailed line by line in Filthy Rich. The interviews with the girls as teenagers are devastating. They are. They're devastating. They are. I think that, that's the only thing some people have said, oh my God, I was reading those interviews. You and have to stop. Just, you know, oh. I had never went on the phone. I was just scared to go. Almost two years after Filthy Rich shared those police interviews with the world, Patterson says Miami Herald reporter Julie Brown picked up where the book left off. A lot of people that made money off of this, he didn't do this all by himself. Patterson credits the Herald's dogged journalism, but believes it was a link to Donald Trump 
that fanned the interest from the national press. My relationship with the president's outstanding. I think that, and this is also crazy, why it got picked up nationally so big was because of Acosta. Donald Trump's labor secretary, Alexander Acosta, was the prosecutor at the time in Miami. The Palm Beach State Attorney's Office was ready to let Epstein walk free, no jail time. He ultimately cut the plea deal with Epstein's attorneys, dumbing down the charges to simply prostitution. The deal also shielded Epstein's co-conspirators, giving them immunity, basically, and Epstein a mere 13-month jail sentence. The deal, years later, it seemed, outraged the press and the public. It was like, ooh, we have a story because Acosta, Trump appointed Acosta as Secretary of Labor, and who cares about the girls? But, ooh, we got Acosta, the Secretary of Labor, now we can pull Trump into this thing. We did what we did because we wanted to see Epstein go to jail. He needed to go to jail. Like so many, Malloy and Patterson have plenty of questions about the then Florida prosecutor turned labor secretary and the Palm Beach County State Attorney Barry Krischer, who was at the helm locally when that deal was brokered. Filthy Rich did a pretty good job of painting the picture of who this guy was. Uh, we didn't settle why did Acosta or, or Barry Krischer do or not do what they should have done, if that was even the case. We, did, we didn't, we, we raised it, we didn't answer it. Nobody's answered it yet. How did this happen locally? How did he get only 13 months and get to go to his lawyer's office and get to go home? Uh, what the heck's going on with that? You still have questions. Yeah, everybody does. Though some of them can be answered, says Patterson, when you look practically at the case. The fact that many of the victims had taken hush money. No, I, I understand why some of these young women took the money and walked away because it would stop the pain, it would stop the investigation, it would, I mean, it, that's a horrifying thing for these kids to be. I, I, I don't think, I think the parents would, 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 would then find out about it, um, but I think, the, the, and, and I think we've all seen it, it's a certain time you just go like, I want this to stop. And Patterson says Epstein's lawyers came from the very intimidating legal big leagues. I think that when Acosta came in, I think the locals said, you know, the, this, this dream team, Dershowitz, that whole group, they're, it's, they're scary good, A. B, a lot of these girls have been bought off already, they're, so they're not, we're not going to be able to use them. C, um, we're not going to be able to prove that some of them actually went to his house. And D, the ones that we do get in the courtroom, um, the dream team of lawyers is going to rip them apart. So we're on real shaky ground here. If we were going to go after Epstein on prostitution charges, we got them. But in terms of building a bigger case, this, this, could, be, this could be tricky and we could lose. And I think that's why, I, th I think that's why Acosta took the deal. Practically, legalistically, Patterson says he sees the logic, but emotionally. You know, is it w one of the great injustices uh, in, in modern times? I, it's certainly right up there. Uh, it, it doesn't get a lot worse than this. I mean, there is some, a lot of injustice. I mean, you have people going to prison for life who didn't do the uh, crimes. I think that's probably worse. Right. But this is, this is a bad one, you know, with Epstein getting the, the 13 months which was amazing, it was shocking, it was just stunning. I mean, if some crazy person out in West Palm uh, was involved with 20 girls from the local high schools, I mean, they'd put him away forever and everybody would cheer. He still comes down here. He, he was down two or three weeks ago. And it was the injustice of it all that kept Malloy and Patterson following Epstein right up until his final days. Uh, he looked old and tired. He said only a few words, not guilty, and yes, sir. The two were producing a Netflix documentary on Epstein when he was arrested in New York. And the controversy is growing. Malloy, front and center once again when Epstein faced a judge for the crimes. I was sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein as a child. In the end, the girls who choose to speak will get their voices heard in Patterson's Netflix documentary. But this duo, they're on to other projects now. Patterson excited about a soldier story they're writing together. Well, here's half of it. <laughs> I think it's going to be one of the most interesting books about soldiering, uh, certainly that I've ever read. Really?
Our cameras got this rare glimpse inside Patterson's office at his Palm Beach home. It's lined with dozens of working projects, documentaries, movies, kids shows and dramas, an engine of literature and Patterson <laughs> managing it all. I'm doing a, a John Lennon book, which I'm really excited about. It seems this fiction guy is getting pretty comfortable in the nonfiction aisles these days. Does it make you chuckle now to know that the most prolific fiction writer of our time unpacked the worst, possibly worst human trafficking case of our time? The, Filthy Rich and the experience, I mean, it's certainly one of the highlights of my writing career uh, in that, I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, what's happened here? This is, it is a major story. It is, as I said, I think it's the major Me Too story. Uh, and, and it will be a major story in this decade in terms of, and, and as it gets wider, as people find out more about the trafficking that, that has been going on for a long time. And clearly it's shifted you in terms of what your interests are now, in terms of what you're pursuing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I'm much more into the nonfiction thing than I was before. Uh, and I'm, I'm better equipped to deal with it now than I was. In fact, New York prosecutors who rounded up Epstein in New York just months ago talked about the press and its role in finally bringing Jeffrey Epstein to justice. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Tim and I took a lot of satisfaction out of the fact that there was, you know, some of the prosecutors were, did, did credit investigative journalism. And at least from our point of view, the idea that we were out there, you know, in 2016 with the story, we, we took the biggest chance in terms of getting sued because, you know, Epstein's people were at us. That is really gratifying because uh, in a lot of ways we're sort of, uh, we're criticized a lot by authorities and, and legal system and judges, but that was them saying what I believe, they believe firmly that if tenacious reporters, and I'm not saying it's me, it was a lot of people, this guy, you know, no matter what the police investigation takes, where it took us, uh, journalists got him in the end. Uh, journalists got him. I'm saying it's me, but it's a real object lesson in the power of this and not uh, giving up when you see something really dark happening. And even a glimmer of light, according to Patterson, if there is one. I, I think this, what's happened here, the, this, the way it, the closure that we're getting, it will do a lot of good things. The, I think the biggest thing it's going to do is, is we're going to pay a lot more attention to trafficking. And that's massive. It, we're not paying enough attention to it, and I think we will. Uh, I think it will add some more fuel to the Me Too movement, I think in good ways, because this is really, this isn't some BS thing, this is really a horrifying story, and it's real and it happened. And I hope, I hope most or all of these women can walk away from this thing and, and, and feel they got some kind of closure. It's not, it may not be what they want, but you know, okay, he got his just desserts. And I've said it before, I, I took no joy out of the fact the guy killed himself. I would have liked to have seen him, I, I'm not a capital punishment person, but I, I would have liked to have seen him in jail for the rest of his life. Um, um, the end. James Patterson and Tim Malloy's documentary on the Jeffrey Epstein saga is due out on Netflix in 2020. On behalf of all of us here at News Channel 5, thanks for watching. Good night.